Hello, and welcome to Divine Savior Church as we gather together for this uh, very festive day. It's the day of Easter, the day in which Christians across the world gather together and celebrate the most incredible victory that is found in our resurrected Lord. It is a privilege to be with you this morning. We look forward to, to bringing God's word to you and celebrating, if even from afar, the truth that in Christ we have one who has done everything he said he would do. The promised Savior is our Savior indeed. If you are joining us for the first time this morning, if you happen to be visiting with us, please know that it is, in fact, a privilege to be able to, to share God's word with you this morning and to share the, the Easter message with you. Before we begin, a couple of announcements. One is that if you are watching us on our church online platform, you will see a couple of different tools or tabs that can be used at different points during the service. If you look at the upper right hand portion of that church online screen, you will see, uh, for example, a, a connect tab. Whether it's during the worship service or shortly after, or even if you wanna come back at a different time, we ask you to fill one of those connect forms out so that we have an opportunity to know who was with us as we were worshiping this morning. It also gives me an opportunity to see how I can better serve you in the future. We'll also take a moment to, to, to highlight the prayer request tab that's found on that upper right hand corner. If you fill that out, whether now or anytime in the future, you'll also have the opportunity to share with me what's on your heart and better let me know what I can pray for with regard to your situation. There's also a, an opportunity to contribute to our ministry financially by, by giving an online offering. During our worship today, we will pause after the message and I'll once again draw attention to these functionalities so that you have a chance to connect with us and to, to bring your prayers uh, before our Lord together as well. Once again, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's Easter, a day of celebration. And before we begin our worship, please be reminded that for centuries, the Christian church has greeted one another on Easter with a simple phrase. One would say, He is risen and you would respond, he is risen indeed, alleluia. And so today I greet you with those words. He is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. We worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We join in our first hymn, This Joyful Easter Tide. This joyful Easter tide away with sin and sorrow. My love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. Had Christ, who once was slain, not burst his three day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now is Christ the risen, the risen, the risen. But now is Christ the risen. Death's blood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. Lover of souls from ill, my path. 
and for a season's slumber. Till Trump from east to west shall wake the dead in number. Had Christ who once was slain not burst his three day prison, our faith had been in vain. But now is Christ arisen, arisen, arisen. But now is Christ arisen. Dear friends who have gathered to, to worship with us this Easter, what an amazing opportunity we have on this Easter morning to come before our Father in heaven and to admit who we are without him, to admit who we are by nature. We do that by confessing our sins as a group before our Father in heaven, only to then hear the incredible words of forgiveness that are found in Jesus, our resurrected Lord. You see, this is the heartbeat of the Christian life, recognizing that in and of ourselves, we are without hope and without victory. But with Christ our Savior, the victory has been found, the forgiveness of sins. Dear friends, we have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and his punishment. Let us therefore confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. We confess. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and deserve do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God now give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of this forgiveness, this forgiveness which can only be found in Christ and his work on the cross and in the empty tomb, let us now praise the Lord, and we do so by joining together in the next song. i
We pray. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you conquered death and opened the gate to eternal life. Grant that we, who have been raised with him through baptism, may walk in the newness of life and ever rejoice in the hope of sharing his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise now and forever. Amen. On this Easter morning, we now have the opportunity to hear one of the lessons appointed for this day. And it takes us to a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the group of Christians gathering in the city of Corinth. The letter is called 1 Corinthians, and chapter 15 of his letter really highlights the incredible truths that are a reality because of Christ's resurrection. And in the short section that I read for you now, chapter 15, verses 51 through 57, we are reminded that Christ's victory gives us a hope that the victory is now ours. He has conquered death once and for all. We listen. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Our worship continues with the singing of our next song. Grace, which is God's undeserved love. Mercy, which is God taking that love and putting it into action in your lives. And peace, which is the result of that love. 
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours this Easter morning. Through faith in Christ, our resurrected Lord. And it's in his name that we gather together So I'm curious this morning, how easy was it for you to get out of bed? How easy was it for you to get out of bed this particular Easter Sunday morning? Now, maybe the thought of of getting up and and brewing that first cup of coffee was an incentive, and, and maybe you've done that, and you're up and running now. But after all, it is Easter. And if Easter is a a regular routine in your life and and a regular routine for your family, and it's one of those days that you look forward to every year, and then you woke up on this particular Easter, a day when you can't get out of the house, at least not to go to a worship service, when you can't enjoy an Easter breakfast, which might be a tradition for some, when you can't perhaps go to an Easter sunrise service or or go out and, and do an Easter egg hunt with other people, maybe you woke up to a little bit of sadness this morning. How how hard was it for you to get out of bed? Or maybe if Easter isn't a regular part of your life, and I, and I ask how hard it is for you to get out of bed, this morning you would say, well, normally I can pop right out of bed, but what are we on now? Day, how many of this safer at home decree from our local officials? And all the days are starting to blur into one, and it's really hard to find excitement because the normal things that used to get us up and excited They just don't seem to have the same pizzazz to them, the same excitement. Well, I'm joining you in that. Because I'll admit that it hasn't been particularly easy for me to get out of bed the last couple of days. It just seems like we all need a win. Do you understand that expression? We we need a win. It feels like There are so many different things going on in our world that are negative, are are weighing us down, that that we feel like are are losses. And aren't you like me and you're just craving a win? A victory? Something to celebrate? My prayer is that our worship today will provide that for you. Because you know who else needed a win? We're going to look at three different people. Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and John. Three of the first to discover the reality of Easter morning. But boy, if anyone needed a win, it was those three. And so take a look with me now as we work through that section of Scripture that takes us back to the first Easter and we hear this incredible account of what Easter means. And we'll see that Easter brings the victory that everyone needs. I read to you from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, 
The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over into the tomb. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of our Lord. You who are my friends in Christ, you who perhaps had a difficult time getting out of bed this morning, I wonder how difficult it was for Mary, Mary Magdalene, to get out of bed that first Easter morning. She was needing a win, wasn't she? It certainly seemed like her world had come crashing down around her. Being one of the the first followers of Jesus, being one who had put all her hope and all her trust and all her friendship in Jesus, only to have seen and witnessed Jesus dying on the cross on that good Friday. And so in some ways, I'm sure it would have been very difficult for her to get out of bed so early on that Sunday morning. And yet, in another way, she probably was eager to go. Because that's what we hear, that early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary went to the tomb. I imagine it had been a very sleepless night. And maybe whereas you're not always eager to get out of bed, you also know the restless feeling of when you're sitting in bed and you can't fall asleep because you have all the thoughts going through your mind. And so that's Mary's situation. Mary wondering how the past events could have possibly happened and wondering about what it meant for her future life. Mary, who just watched her dear friend, the one that she had put her hope in as the Savior, the one who had been the Redeemer, the one who had promised great things, she had just watched with her own eyes and seen him crucified. And so we know from the other gospel accounts that what was on their mind was, well, first thing on Sunday morning after the Sabbath requirements have been fulfilled, maybe we can get some closure. Maybe with heavy hearts and maybe with destroyed hopes, we can at least visit the tomb and give a proper burial. Pay our last respects to the one that we thought was the great hope. 
And so I'm sure, even though she couldn't sleep, but yet with weary legs, she went to the tomb. (sighs) But did you see what she saw? The stone had been removed from the entrance. From a distance, she had seen that the stone which had been placed in front of the tomb had been removed, and that triggered the adrenaline. That triggered triggered the, the, the confusion, and it triggered the run, perhaps the run of her life, back to find the disciples. And so there she is, seeking out Peter and John. And it triggered again this resurrection relay race of sorts. But for Mary, the confusion continued. She was looking for a win. And the only win that was possibly in her mind is, maybe I can get some closure in saying goodbye to my dear friend and the one who I had prayed and hoped was so much more. But her mind jumped to the conclusion that someone had opened the tomb and taken his body and she was robbed of that chance for a win. To say goodbye. For the moment, let's leave Mary there. But at the same time, let's put ourselves in her situation. You do know the feeling that Mary had. And it may be not apples to apples because you aren't right at this moment grieving the loss of a loved one, although you might be. And it might not be that you are grieving the fact that you didn't have a chance to have closure in saying goodbye to someone you loved, although you might be. But you take those two circumstances and you put them together and you know exactly the problem that Mary was going through. Because it's one that we wrestle with too on these days in which we feel like we can't get a win, when we feel like things are crashing down upon us, when we feel that all is dark and dreary and that we don't live in hope. What do we crave more than anything? We crave to have some semblance of control in our lives. We want to be able to say that we have control and that we can can take matters into our own hands just to give us the comfort of knowing that there's one thing we can do well. And so we try to control different environments. We try to control our home environment. We try to control our workplace. And yet what so often happens is that living in this sinful world, living in this fallen world, we are robbed of even that sensation. And we realize that so often the very control we desire, we can't have. And we feel helpless. And it makes it hard to get out of bed sometimes. Have you felt that way with the the recent virus and the outbreak and the domino effect that has hit our society? We feel like we've lost complete control. There's not a single thing we feel we can do anymore And we're just waiting for the next domino to fall and it can be a very powerless feeling. All we want is a victory. All we want is a win. And so there is Mary. Struggling. We'll come back to her. But now we turn our attention to John and Simon Peter as that relay race starts. They hear the news that someone had had tampered with the tomb. They hear the news that the The stone had been rolled away, and they go running. Maybe they had a hard time getting out of bed that morning. But with the news from Mary, they're sprinting. So let's sprint with them. And so we hear that the younger one, John, he makes it to the tomb first, but he doesn't go in. And then Peter, he runs right past him into the tomb. And then John catches up. And do you hear the incredible sights that they behold? Do you hear how they describe it? Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He, that is John, bent over 
and looked at the strips of linen, uh, of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. And with that, we get our first glimpse of the win. Because it wasn't that someone had tampered with the body. It wasn't that someone had tampered with the stone. It was that the truth of the resurrection was now being proclaimed by the fact that the tomb was empty. And they had seen the evidence. They had seen the burial cloths and the linen. They had seen it all put aside, but there was no body to be found. And what was the thing that the disciples wanted most? They wanted a Savior whose word was trustworthy. They wanted a Savior who could carry out all the amazing things that he said he could do. And now as John peers into the tomb and he sees that there is no body, with such simplicity he recounts, he saw and believed. You see, it's what he didn't see that matters. What he didn't see was the remains of one who had been defeated on Good Friday. What he didn't see were the remains of the sins of this world, buried but not officially dealt with. But what he did see was empty. What he did see was a victory. He got the win in seeing that Jesus was victorious over sin. Oh sure, this truth, the victory, it would take time to set in with the disciples. That's why it says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, but it makes it clear that John believed. He believed because he was seeing with his own eyes that the resurrection had happened The victory that everyone needs is found in an empty tomb. Why? Because it's the culmination of everything that we have learned in Scripture. It's the action of Christ rising from the dead that gives us hope and joy beyond everything else. Because from the very beginning of Scripture, when we were plunged into a sin-sick world with the first sin of Adam and Eve, the hope had been set that someday a Savior from sin would come. And someday that Savior from sin was going to take upon Himself in all of His perfection, all of your sin, and He was going to pay for it on the cross. And with eyes wide open and tears streaming down our cheeks, we watched as that happened on Good Friday. And yet, was that payment sufficient? Was that payment accepted by our just God? Was the one who gave his life on Good Friday adequate to be our Savior? And with the empty tomb, we see that the victory is official. The judgment has been made. Christ is the winner. And we get the win that we've been craving. You see, Easter changes lives. Easter changes lives because it gives us a hope in an otherwise hopeless environment that our sins are paid for and we stand at peace with God. Because maybe one of the hardest things about getting out of bed in the morning is knowing that it will be yet another day of living in anger or living in sadness, or living in frustration because we are concerned about our relationship with God. And if that's the case, look at the empty tomb. 
and believe that Jesus is victorious and his resurrection proves that your sins have been paid for. That does change lives. Which brings us straight back to Mary. Remember how much she needed the wind? Remember how she thought that the tomb had been tampered with and, and ran back to find the disciples? But her heart was still sinking and her faith was still shaking. And so long after now, Peter and John, full of faith and hope, left the tomb to tell others. We hear that Mary was still hanging around. And what was she doing? But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. That's not hard to understand, is it? It's not something that we usually like to talk about, but I'll just ask you straight out this morning, when was the last time that you cried? And as you're thinking about that, I'm simply going to ask you, and why was it? What is it that brought you to tears? And my guess is that it probably wasn't tears of joy, although it's a possibility. But when was the last time you cried because you realized the sadness of a situation, when you realized the loss of a situation, when you realized that an event had just transpired that, that just knocked you over? And you know that profound feeling of sadness. Was it the loss of a friend, whether because that friend died or because that friend turned his back on you? Because that can really knock us over. That can bring tears from our eyes. It can make us realize how challenging life is without having the relationships that we need. Was it the, last, the loss of a, of a leader? I say that because what do you think Mary is thinking when she sees that, that it's not only her friend that she can't find, it's her leader, the one in whom she had put her hope. And isn't it true that we sometimes put our hope in people only to have it dashed and it can cause tears? Hope is something we all desire. It's the win that we want. And for Mary, the realization that Christ wasn't there And the thought that it was because someone had stolen the body and the realization that it was possible that Jesus wasn't the promised Savior, it was all too much for her to withstand and she just had to cry. But remember that Easter is the victory everyone needed. We see that in the empty tomb And we now see that in the drying of tears. Which is what makes this section of Scripture so incredibly real. As Mary is standing there, weeping in front of the tomb, two different times she's asked the question, why are you crying? One was asked by the angels, whom the Lord had sent, to announce the truth, and yet to Mary, the question, why are you crying? And then it was from the gardener, who is the Lord himself, our resurrected Lord, Mary, why are you crying? Well, to her, it must have seemed obvious, and yet, for our resurrected Lord, the question is an answer. It's Jesus' way of saying, now that you know that I'm alive, now that you know that I have done everything that I promised I would do and that I am victorious, now that you know that all of the promises about who I am and what I came to do and that all of the guarantees that will be made and that all of the promises of the Old Testament have found their fulfillment in me and on this day the tomb is empty, why are you crying? Because it's the victory everyone needs. 
He's not saying that this side of heaven will never have to feel sadness again. But what Jesus is saying when he interacts with Mary on that very special Easter morning is that despite the challenges and despite the sadness, Christians get the victory. And so maybe we no longer cry for fear or sadness. Maybe we no longer cry out of frustration, but maybe now the tears that flow are the tears of joy in the fact that our resurrected Lord wipes the sadness from our eyes. This is Easter morning. This is the day that we have been celebrating for years and years because the truth never gets old. Yes, we all feel like we need the victory. And in Christ, we have it. This Easter morning, be reminded of the last words that Jesus spoke to Mary. Having proven that he was the resurrected Lord and that he cared enough to dry her tears, to comfort her, to show her that it truly was her, the victorious one. He then says, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. And with those words, Jesus has leveled the playing field. He says, those sins that used to separate you from God, from your Father in heaven, no, they are gone. You got the victory through me. And now it's not just my God, but it's your God. It's not just my Father, it's your Father. In Easter, we are reminded that the family has come back together. Payment has been made. Payment has been accepted. Sins have been forgiven. It's the victory everyone needed. I don't know how hard it was for you to get out of bed this morning. I do know the circumstances of Easter 2020 are far different than past Easter's. And yet, as we look at the Word of God and the account of that first Easter, my legs can't sit still. My body is eager to get up and get moving because we now have an incredible truth. We got the win through Christ. And now we get to tell people about it. God bless your Easter celebration. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may it guide your hearts and your minds in Jesus our Lord. Amen. And now at this time, we'll take a, a, a moment where you can pause and you can stop and you can take a look at some of those links on the upper right hand of your screen. Feel free. I'd love to have you fill out a Connect card to let us know that you were worshiping with us this morning. Also, take the time to fill out a prayer request if you have something on your heart. And what is more, if you'd like to support the ministry of Divine Savior, feel free to, to click on that link as well. And we'll conclude our worship in a couple moments. We conclude our worship now with an Easter prayer as well as the blessing of our Lord. We pray. Thanks be to you, O Lord, for giving us the victory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, you have not forsaken us or left us to our own destruction, but kept your ancient promise to send a Savior, 
We praise you for his perfect life, his innocent death, and his glorious resurrection. Because of your faithfulness to your promises, today is a day of victory. Savior Jesus, we praise you for carrying out God's plan of salvation. Your resurrection is undeniable evidence that you have triumphed over sin, death, hell, and the devil. Because of your resurrection, today is a day of victory. Holy Spirit, we praise you that through the gospel you have led us to know and believe that Jesus is our risen Savior. Today we say confidently, as did the angel, He is not here. He has risen. Preserve us in faith. Raise us to newness of life. Continue to lavish on us the blessings of this day of victory. Triune God, kindle in our hearts a love for all people. Equip us with both the will and the words to tell others that Jesus has indeed risen from the grave. Use us to share the message of the empty tomb so that others too may rejoice in Jesus' Easter victory. Lord of life, comfort all who stand at death's door. Comfort all who mourn the loss of a loved one who has died in faith in the risen Savior. Comfort each of us with the assurance that because Jesus lives, we too will live. Remind us all that the death of a Christian is not a defeat. Because of Jesus, it is a day of victory. Thanks be to you, O Lord, for giving us the victory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, a very happy and joyful Easter to you and your family. It's a privilege to have been able to, to worship with you and bring you God's word on this special day. I ask you to continue to, to come back to this website, to check out who we are as Divine Savior Church, and as you are able to, to worship with us in the future. We'll continue to, to have our regularly scheduled worship services at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Look forward to having you join us. And now, Receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve your Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We conclude our worship with our final song. God be with you. So deep, so high, so broad The Trinity whom we adore Forever and forevermore Forgive me
Blessings on your celebration of our risen Savior. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter from the Denches. Hello, everyone. Happy Easter from the Bivens family. We miss not being together today, but we look forward to seeing you soon. He, he is, is risen. risen. Happy Easter from the Thomas family. Hello all from the Palmer family. Just to let you know that we're doing fantastic and the reason we're doing fantastic is because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter. Hey everyone, we just wanted to say Happy, Happy Easter. Easter! We miss all of you so, so much. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter! He is risen! Happy Easter! Happy Easter everyone. He is risen. We hope you have a wonderful and blessed Easter worship.